And these apply to more than just first. So number one, always build within your team's limits. Evaluate your abilities and resources honestly and realistically. We talked about the Jordan Court. Limits like fears are often an illusion. But you need to be realistic when evaluating this game. And so, I'm, I don't know, I'm shot and proud, is that how you pronounce it? I have, I, I enjoy this. Sometimes I'll go on Chief Delphi at the beginning of the season, and I will see teams making predictions of what they think their robot's going to do. And it's terrifying. The amount of teams this year were like, oh yeah, we'll score 100 points a match. You will? 100 points a match? Going through the data this year, consistently there was only about three teams in the world who were doing 100 points a match. But if you ran on Chief Delphi, like every Tom, Dick, and Harry was like, oh yeah, 100 points a match, that's no problem, that's no problem. Forget about just making fun of the, like there was this one guy, he's like, 100 points a match. This was like after the row card, like, I guarantee it. I went through their stats. They were scoring like six points a match. How do you get it? Where, where are you? Honestly, evaluate your resources. You want to look at these things. But here's the thing. You do yourself a disservice. If you set yourself up that I need to score 100 points a match, you're going to overextend <coughs> and build something that's not going to be able to do the job. The teams I love, 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 are the teams who realize what you need to do to be successful, and they know what they can do. Um, best example would be in 2012, Team 43-34. Rookie team. They made a goal of, they want to win champs. But they knew they were a rookie, and they knew they had to do, they weren't, they realized, we're not going to be the hot team, we're not going to be 254. So, they realized, wow, triple balance is a very important part of this game. So, they built a tiny little robot. Super, super small because they knew it could help facilitate triple balances. They knew triple balances needed three robots, that's how triple works, you know? And they wanted to be the best facilitator of that. Now they were in a unique position, because they were a rookie team, and they knew this strategy is not going to risk any us. So let's throw a huge set of resources in winning the Rookie All-Star Award. Let's go over our community and do things. Let's put them into this wicked package, and let's get ourselves the chance. And they built this little, tiny robot that can lower a bridge, also could score a couple points in autonomous and could move some balls around. Other teams that year were like, oh, well, number one thing you need to do is build a shooter. You need to build a shooter. Everyone thought you needed to build, what was the name of that game? Rebound Rumble? I don't know, everyone just gets distracted by the game piece. It's like, I have to shoot, I have to shoot, I have to shoot. The biggest point in that game was the triple balance. It needed three teams. And most people missed that completely. Not 43-34. They had a plan exactly where they said, we want to be a little robot, because we know that a lot of teams, wide robots were probably the way to go if you want to facilitate balances. But they knew that teams were going to be long robots, who were very good at scoring, but would have a harder time tripling. And they became the perfect partner for high power scoring alliances. And if you want to win champs as a rookie team, that's exactly what you want to be. And man, they almost won champs. And I'm going to go on a rant right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> they should have won chance! <laughs> if it wasn't, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but it's all about keeping things simple. This year at the Waterloo Regional, um, Team 5406, rookie team, and they basically said, we want to do two stacks with the human player. Then we can do two stacks with the human player, but that's all we're ever going to do. Only use COTS parts, simple human load in, human load in, human load in, and they finish super early. Why did they finish super early? Because they knew that they wanted to practice, practice, practice. And they were one of the highest scoring robots of the entire season. But it's all about evaluating your resources, figuring out what you can do, and being the best at it, which ties into golden rule number two. If a team has 30 units of robot functions, and functions can be like a maximum of 10. It's better to do three things at 10 out of 10 than five at six out of 10. Specialize, specialize, specialize. Forget about the first role right now. Again, room full of high school students here, and for the most part, overachievers, which is awesome. The world needs overachievers to solve big problems. However, there are limits to what, how much you can do. So, 
I see this happen so often with high school kids, where it's like, yeah, you know, I want to do first. I also want to be on the debate team. I want to run cross country. And they try and do everything. And what suffers? The grades. And I'm going to tell you guys a horrible lesson right now, but I want you to hear it right now. For every college admissions officer that tells you, oh, we want to make sure you're super well-rounded, and you do everything, and we want this, we want that, we want that, they're lying to you. Realistically, your college admissions, and this is more so for all the people from Ontario in the house, please, please pay attention. It's all about them grades, about them grades, about them grades. <laughs> it's terrifying. The University of Waterloo, where I went, which is my opinion, this is my opinion, but I hate this, but in my opinion, one of the best schools in Canada and North America, they don't care about anything other than your grades. It, it's terrifying because they say, oh, like, I've seen too many good students get rejected from this fine institution because they spent too much time off first and their grades dropped. And they may have been rock stars in the first community, Dean's List winners. There's a limit to what you can do. There's only so much you can do. Don't spread yourself too thin. If you want to be successful, focus on a couple things and be awesome at them. Don't try and do everything and end up being mediocre at them. The jack of all trades is the master of none. So, definitely explore your options out there. Because that's what youth is about. That's what life is about. You know, you should always be trying to explore your options, figure out what's out there for you. But at some point, you have to make hard decisions. You can't do everything. So that's like a life thing. And like, it's really important. Like, I want you to walk away from this seminar and think about that stuff. Because I don't want to see you guys burning out. And there's nothing worse than seeing high school kids, especially because first is such an amazing program. We love it. We, 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 that's why we're all here. And it's sad when people dedicate too much time to first, and they end up hurting their chances of success. We see it in university. The amount of kids that go out and say, hey, I'm done with high school, but I want to come back and mentor. And they want to put in the same level of time they did when they were in high school. But university is harder than high school. High school is kind of easy. I know, it doesn't seem like that right now. It's, anytime someone says that, I sound like a jerk right now, so I, I shouldn't have said that. But you can't, you'll, I've seen too many first kids burn themselves out. Like, literally, I've seen too many first kids fail out of engineering in the first year because they were spending too much time entering their first team. <laughs> this is actually a thing. I don't want to see that happen to any of you. Because, um... Failing out of first year university, like, it's like, oh, well, I'll just go to another school. But everything you did in high school disappears. Once you're in university and you have that bad first year, that sticks with you. It's not going anywhere. This awesome program that we have is still going to be here in four years. Granted, there might be two championships, but it's still going to be here. <laughs> Take some time, explore, do some other things. Your team will survive without you. I know it may not seem like it, but trust me, those like freshmen, you know, what do you guys call them? freshmen and sophomores, they will be there. So, don't over it. Anyways, that's not really random. These rules are really important when it comes to building I mean, especially as we have games with more and more tasks, it's super important that you don't try to do There are very few teams that can get away with everything. I'll, I'll give you the 11-14 experience this year. Um, we made some major, major sacrifices in the design. Because we saw this as the most complicated game uh, since, I don't know when, but basically the most, the most complicated game we've ever gotten. So right away we said we couldn't do everything. The first one was capping other people's stacks. We knew we wanted to be an internal stacker. And then we're like, we're like oh, well, it'd be really good to cap other people's stacks. And we're like, that's a whole other mechanism. Like, we'd have to basically, one, be able to get some linear reach, and two, our elevator's passive. There's nothing powering our elevator up. We would have had to power the elevator, claw elevator separately, and we just said, can't do it. Gave it up. That's a huge piece of functionality. Co-op. Man, we knew how important those co-op points were. At the same time, we just said, there's only so many things we can do, and co-op's not a thing in the elimination rounds. Hopefully we can get our partners to do it. We were to leave some things to our partners, and we did until this weekend. But that's another thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that because now it might not work. <laughs> we're going to try.
try. Please go up with this. Okay. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone in the room right now. <laughs> Trade offs. This is what it comes down to. So, you've decided, hey, I can't do everything in the game. What am I going to trade off? The key to design upon design is to evaluate the trade offs. This year, at the highest end, there was a major, major trade off teams had to make. Were they going to go for the fastest camp burglar? Or were they going to go for a crazy scoring? And that's a trade off that I don't know what the right answer is right now. Because as much as I think the cans are all that matter, at the same time, there's not going to be alliances of just teams that grab cans and then sit around and sing kumbaya afterwards. <laughs> There's still stacking that's going to be going on. But man, how do you decide upon your trade-offs? How do you know what you need to do? You've got to go back to your priority list. Things that are high on your priority list based on your analysis of the game are the ones you want to hold on to. We let go of co-op because co-op wasn't a factor in the elimination rounds. If it was somehow, if they said, if you put three totes on that step, and forget about what your opponent does, if you put three so you still get points for your alliance, we absolutely call up with the number one priority. Right up there, because still, 40 points in the normal matches, it was points in the elims, it would have been a thing. But it wasn't, so it was lower on the priority list, and it got traded off. Always, I say you print that priority list of what the most important tasks are, and stick it up in your shop in like multiple places. Because teams forget about their brainstorming. Like, we do all this work right before kickoff, and then everyone starts building. You just forget about why you're building what you're building. And if you lose track of your initial priorities, you will get lost and you will trade off the wrong things. The worst trade off I've ever seen. So, there was this one team at a regional, and I can't mention any names here. And they were overweight at inspections, so they needed to take off weight. They had four sims in their drive. They're like, oh, let's take off a sim. Now, first of all, I disagree with this decision on a fundamental level because drive training is their number one priority. They're going to single sims back in a year when it was heavy defense. That's really, really bad. But also, they, they did the worst thing. They only took one sim off. <laughs> <laughs> they left two on one side and one on the other side. What are they doing? That is not how robots work. There's no shame in building a simple robot. There are a lot of teams out there who think there's something embarrassing about using the kit on draft train. They think there's something embarrassing about using Versa Frame or Rev Extrusion. They think you have to do everything custom. There's nothing embarrassing. You know, you, you may be embarrassed about building a simple robot, but your embarrassment will wear down a lot when you have a gold medal around your neck and a blue banner to hang up. <laughs> I'm absolutely serious. Like, no one's laughed. Like, people laughed at 4334's little robot. And I was like, oh, it looks like a little doggy. That's cute. That's cute. That doggy was on Einstein. Whoa! <laughs> I'm allergic to dogs. <laughs> so, when you're thinking about these trade offs, sometimes maybe you don't have to make a trade off. Sometimes, maybe with a small addition, you can find a way to get all the functionality in one thing. And this is pretty cool. Like, I remember there were teams in um, 2012, the game with the bridge, would all, they had an intake that articulated to help get the walls. They used that to lower the bridge. That, that was pretty cool. You need to kind of think, be aware of how you can do these sorts of things. There's the amount of teams this year who, you know, have an intake which was also used as a co-op device. They just made sure their intake could also activate while it was raised a little bit. This is cool ways where you can steal extra functionality. Don't want to talk too much about this because then it becomes into like design stuff, which I don't do. But strategically, sometimes you can find a way to squeeze things in, and it's uh, pretty cool. Again, when making trade-offs, remember your original priorities. Other strategic design tips. This strategic analysis is a must. It's so, so easy on kickoff Saturday to come back to the shop and someone's like, hey, I want to build a shooter. Let's build a shooter. Let's get wheels and just shoot, 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 shoot. Because it's fun. It's exciting. Like every year people are like, I want to build a shooter. Building a shooter is not that hard. Building an accurate shooter is. But everyone right away just wants to start building. It's like, yeah, it shoots. Everyone cheer in our video. Like, no. You need to do the 
this analysis. Otherwise, you're not going to build a robot that is designed to win the game. So, you must know what you want to do before you can figure out how to do it. Wayne Grusky always used to say, I don't go to where the puck is. I go to where the puck is going to be. You cannot design a robot unless you know what you want it to do. Not trying to be zen here, but we're talking about planning. You have to have a concrete plan. And once you have that plan, it is so much easier to actually execute it. That sounds stupid. It's easier to execute a plan if you have a plan. Well, yeah, but be, why don't people plan stuff? Ugh. Be realistic when evaluating strategies. You know, like I talked about 100 points per match, dude. It's like you're scoring six. Like every, this year, people don't realize how low scores are. You look at the, there's regionals where there's not a single yellow toad on the field in the elimination rounds. Just think about. How do I break this to you? This is an awesome program. We've got a lot of great people who are all going to do amazing, successful things. But in general, teams are not nearly as good as people think. It, it, it is the truth. There are some teams that are just like wicked awesome, but in general, building a robot is a hard thing to do in six weeks. And teams have big goals, but most don't execute those goals. And the teams who realize, wait a second, I only, everyone's saying we score 100 points a match, but I bet you if we just focused on 25 points a match and made sure we could do that, we could, you know, win our regionals and stuff, those are the teams who win. It's focusing on something small and attainable and then nailing it. Remember, you have partners, you can't depend on them for stuff. I think this year there was just, teams were afraid to depend on their partners, and we just, I don't know. It's just very weird because I think that there was an opportunity this year for like very specialized robots to go and just dominate. Where you have someone who just builds crazy stacks fast with a robot that's basically a factory, doesn't even move, and then someone that just specializes cans, drop them off, drop them off. And it just didn't materialize. Like there's so few teams out there who can actually put a can on top of someone else's six stack. And I maybe I misread the game because I thought all oh, that was going to be one more thing. At the same time, our team was like, we're not letting anyone put a can on our stacks, we're doing that ourselves, because <laughs> you don't want to leave too much in your partner's hands. And it was interesting during alliance selection, because you'd see teams who, I mean, there was one regional, and um, team picked the team, they were good at stacking, but there was a wicked can placer. And so they were like, and they forego, like, whatever, a team that could do two six stacks with can on their own, because they wanted the wicked cap, because they're like, way high end potential. So two complementary robots. The danger of two complementary robots is if one robot fails, both robots have failed. And so their first match they went out there and they put up like a measly 30 points at the quarters. Second match, they put up the highest score of the quarters. Unfortunately it was too late, they were knocked out. So I get why people were afraid of specialization this year, because it does open you up. At the same time, if you're a lower resource team, specialization was the only way you were going to make a mark. I don't know why I leave this slide. Every year I do this presentation, I come to this slide, I say, why is this slide in? Could someone please make sure I delete this slide next to me? I like it all. Okay, I want to stop for a second here. Are any of these other mics live? Awesome. You want to do me a favor, Stephen? You want to field some questions for me? So, does anyone have any questions right now before we get into the scouting stuff?